G'day everyone, how's it going? I uh, hope, hope you're enjoying DevWorld. Um, I know I sure am. Um, welcome to my talk. This is Size Classes, or how I learned to stop worrying and love iOS 9 multitasking. Um, this is something that I've, it's, it's a bit of a polarizing topic. It kind of got do dropped on us pretty rapidly by Apple a few years ago, and, and I think the adoption's been um, pretty slow, um, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm making it my mission to go around to as many of these places and, and start talking about it. Um, as a quick introduction, I don't really think I have to because James just did it. Uh, my name's Tim. Or if you went to Tri Swift in Tokyo earlier this year, my name is also Tom. There is a lovely backstory about that, but um, you can come and ask me later if you want to hear about it. Um, I'm from Perth. It's a very arduous journey all the way from Western Australia to Melbourne, but it's always a, always a worthwhile trip. Um, I've come to DevWorld a lot. Um, I started coming in 2010, and I've only missed the 2013 one. Um, uh, it's not, it's not an over-exaggeration over to say, it's just to, to state how valuable DevWorld is. I'm pretty convinced it was the kick I needed to get into the iOS industry. Um, it's been, um, it's what I needed to like, actually learn. Like it was the great. It's like that's that's this is where I actually learned what a model view controller pr paradigm was. Um, so it's just been, it's really good to see it. It, it. It's still going, and it's even stronger than it ever was before. So I'm really happy to be back here and to see how well it's going. Um, like if anyone heard in the corridor earlier, I have a I have a thing for Pokemon, possibly too serious. Um, there was a there was a, nearly a bar fight because there was a gym on the bar last night um, when Pokemon Go, Team Mystic, yeah. Um, and, if, and if anyone else was at Dry Swift, uh, you might also know I have a thing for karaoke. Um, <laughs> he could not beat my Vaporeon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I was a web developer straight out of university, um, which, kind of, which kind of went well because then when, when the iPhone 3G dropped and I started getting into iOS development, um, most of the concepts and paradigms of web development move over to like the UI concepts of, of smartphones as well, which is really nice. So, I started becoming a full-time iOS developer in 2013, and I haven't looked back since. Um, like James said, I'm working for a company called Realm right now. It, we're a little company with a dream of making a, a, an offline database framework that involves less tiers and is less soul-crushing than core data. Um, if you want to know more, more about that, I did a talk about it at DevWorld last year, and that should be up on YouTube. Um, if you have any specific questions, you can come see me after this. So why about this topic in particular? Well, I really, really love the iPad Pro. Um, I have been hanging out for this jumbo iPad for so long, I was so excited to hear about it. In fact, I was so excited that when it came out, I accidentally hit buy twice and ended up with two of them, <laughs> which nearly ruined me financially. Um, I, had to, I had to give them back, which is incredibly sad as well. Um, but what, what was even more sad was, um, the thing is, um, the iPad Pro came with iOS 9, and iOS 9 introduced this new paradigm called split screen. And the thing is, uh, no one kn knew about it until iOS 9 dropped, so a lot of apps ha like, didn't, ha didn't adopt it before then, and probably still haven't. Quite a few haven't yet. Um, and it's something I'd really like to just um, continue, like, like to, to like try and explain to everyone how it works. It's not as hard as you think it is, and to just um, make it so more apps work on my lovely giant iPad. Um, outside of work, I am also a huge fan of doing open source now, which is um, something we're well, working for a company like Realm, which is all open source. Um, what I've started to get into the habit of doing, I think, is I want to, um, when I'm working on my own private apps, to, to give them some more value, what I'm trying to do now is, if I'm working on like a, a, a view controller or, or a view, or something that's just not attached to my business logic at all, I'm trying to get into the habit of like modularizing it up and making it an open source package I can put on GitHub, I get the advantage of making sure that it's completely detached. Uh, it gives me an, an, an excuse to make sure the, the API is polished. It also means I can contribute back to the community as well as use it in my own app, um, which is really good. And I get a lot of good feedback, um, and it makes me feel like, happy that I'm actually giving back, hopefully, about the same much of, of the code I'm actually taking from my own projects. Um, Two of my, ma my main apps, um, um, libraries at the moment, is I made a, an open source web view controller that lets you just look at a web page from your own app. Um, Backwards compatible down to the, the first iPad, iOS 5. Um, and that's been interesting um, to support for the latest versions of iOS. Um, it's not so valuable anymore now that iOS 9 has SF Safari View Controller, but um, it's still useful if you want to have uh, backwards compatibility for older libraries, uh, older iOS versions. And the current one that's, that's climbing my ranks at the moment is I, ma I made this last year. This is a crop view controller. So if you want to take a UI image instance and carve it up on inside your app, maybe make a profile picture or something like that. This library, you can just drop it in, give it a UI image, and it'll spit out an equivalent UI image you can then pass on to your, um, your own local code. Um, so these were like my test beds. When iOS 9 dropped and split screen became a thing, the first thing I did was I started fiddling with it to try and see how easy it would be to take two view controllers that were using the old school style of, of, um, of um, rotations and sizes and how it would apply to the new one. 
Um, so as an example of that, here's, uh, here's a picture of uh, some, some random game from Japan. Um, um, and just the concept of like making, it, making your own view controllers respond to size changes. As you can see, the actual the, the control bar actually changes position as well during transitions. It goes to the side when it thinks it's in, in landscape view. Um, and yeah, it was just made, basically a matter of playing with that to see how, how uh, easy or hard it is. And I learned quite a few things, so I thought I'd come and share them today. So really quickly, an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Um, just introducing the concept really quickly, like where we came, uh, where we came from, and where we're heading now. Um, what the API looks like on a very code level. What other features iOS provides that makes our lives a bit more easy. Um, and finally, just some considerations if you're if you're architecting an existing app to use size classes, how how you can actually go about um, what are some good things you can use for it. So, introducing the concept. So a long time ago, in a software version far far away, we had the amazing iPhone 3G, or if you, if you look closer, that's actually a 3GS, because that's the Compass app. Um, and back then, life was simple. We, if we basically just had like a fixed size, a fixed window, and if you wanted to know what, what orientation the device was in, there was a very simple property on the um, Objective-C, because it's old, um, 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 on, on the view controller, so you could see what, what orientation the device was in. You had a bunch of methods you could override if you wanted to do custom layout or handling when the device rotated. Some were implicitly wrapped in animation blocks, which was kind of tricky sometimes, because sometimes you had to figure out where, where your code had to go into which method to make it work properly, um, but for the most part, it was pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, and basically your choices were portrait mode, landscape mode, and this was explicitly dictated by the system. And you had overridable methods. And then this giant stonking great piece of aluminium came along, the first iPad. Does anyone here still have theirs? I still have mine. A few? Yeah, excellent. Cool. Um, and they brought, that brought along the concept of universal applications. So the idea was you could have one binary that would deploy to the iPhone and the iPad. And basically, you could try and reuse as much logic as you could, but if there was cases where you wanted different UI components or different view controllers for the different sizes, you'd have to use this pretty dank macro, UI user interface idiom, to actually tell, to check what platform you're on, and then to actually dictate a very discrete set of code paths for it. Uh, but then WWDC happened, and we got this, uh, apart from the, the lovely announcement of this crazy new language, Swift, we uh, also found out that Apple decided to kill that entire system with fire and bring in a completely new system for handling sizes and rotations on, on iOS devices. Um, if you watch the first What's New in Cocoa Touch, WWDC 2014, um, presentation, they, they basically said, we want to move to a place where our layout code doesn't have to care what orientation it is. Like, they wanted to move away from this abstract, possibly skeuomorphic concept of, of uh, a portrait and landscape and just have it that whatever, re whatever region your app is rendering in, it's just an arbitrary size. And people obviously thought this was in preparation of the, of the jumbo iPhone that was about to land, um, and they weren't wrong. Um, the, new, the jumbo iPhone actually came with a feature that it would actually move between iPhone mode and iPad mode if you rotate the device um, using this new size class system. And I and I'm guessing a lot of other develop developers are like, yeah, that's cool, I guess, that's cool. I'm, I'm probably not going to adopt it just yet because I'm, I'm still, I still need to support iOS 7 and trying to support that and I, like iOS 7's rotations and iOS 8 rotations at the same time would be kind of crazy. And all I can see, or the only benefit I can see from this is I can get like a sweet rotation on the iPhone 6 plus, but okay. So I kind of forgot about it for a bit. And then last year, at WWDC, the poop hit the fan. I just did a search, a Google search for poop hitting fan, and I got that. It was, there was a lot worse entries, but I thought that was the best. Um, <laughs> it was actually a picture of like a, poop, like a, a little animatic poop like with, a, with a chair hitting a fan at one point. Um, that was my favorite. Um, and basically what happened was is it suddenly became clear why Apple wanted to do this. Um, they introduced this, this whole new paradigm where you could actually, on an iPad, render two apps at the same time and actually operate both apps independently at the same time on one screen. And like, a lot of people were just like, whoa, mind blown, this is new, what the hell? And then, uh, uh, at the same time, we're watching the keynote going, wait a minute, wait a minute, how are they doing that? And then, on further inspection, what you can see is not only is an iPad app being rendered on the screen, but when you bring in this split view, uh, it, the, the app automatically transmogrifies into its iPhone variant. And that's, that's huge, because it was like, oh, wait, wait a minute, all of our, <laughs> all of our assumptions have just been changed. What, what, what's going on? So this is pretty crazy, because it was, it, was it, like, it was a very small kind of feature, but it introduced this entire new paradigm shift for how we architect apps. Because now, the concept of having a code path through your iPhone and a code path through your iPad doesn't exist. And the concept of interface orientation doesn't make sense. Because obviously, when you're in 
the iPad could be rotated in landscape, but as you saw, you've got two apps next to each other, but because of the relative sizing, they're technically in portrait mode. So calling it interface orientation is completely pointless. Um, and basically, the system gets to, gets to tell you what, how, how big it thinks the window is and what kind of mode you should render your content is. And the hugest thing is um, at the drop of a hat, your app can be required or by a gesture from the user to completely reconfigure itself from its iPad configuration to its iPhone configuration and then back again. And that can happen at any point during execution on any, on any view, which is kind of like just a whoa kind of, kind of moment. So exploring the API. So wh what is this new API that Apple introduced? Well, basically, back in 2012, Tim Cook got up on stage and very publicly poo-pooed Android by going, ah, oh, look at this. It's just a smartphone app blown up to the, to the tablet. Look how cool the Twitter app looks. I missed that Twitter app. That was a good Twitter app. That was Tweety. Um, if you want a real world example, I'm going I'm to shoot, like, do some shots fired here. And all we have to do is look at the Dev World app, because the Dev World app is exactly the same. Like, it looks great on the iPhone, but on my iPad Pro, it's, it's pretty liberal in its use of white space. Um, <laughs> pretty liberal. Um, but yeah, so the entire point of the system called size classes is to make sure that this doesn't happen. Like, it's, it's supposed to be like a wedge to separate like small content and large content, so you don't have like this arbitrary. It, it's not up to the user to, to try and figure out what their best size is. It's up to the system to say, okay, you should be in iPhone mode, you should be in iPad mode. So what are size classes exactly? They're very simple. They're just a single enum or enum. Enum? I don't know. We had, we had this argument at Realm once. Um, <laughs> Um, and it's just two values, basically, compact and regular. And their entire goal is to basically, they're dictated by the system to say how, how big the system thinks the screen you're rendering in is, and so how you should respond to that with your UI layout code. So as a really quick example, here's all the major devices. So as you can see on normal iPhones, iPhone 4S through to the 6, um, it is comp compact height and compact width in both orientations. On the 6 Plus, it's regular height and compact width when it's portrait, and it's regular width and compact height when it's landscape. And this is why when you like, look at the settings app on the iPhone 6 Plus in that orientation, you get the iPad mode. And then on an iPad, you have regular width in both directions. And then to compound that, when iOS 9 came out, now we have regular width, regular, comp yeah, re regular, width, regular height in both. But then when you enable split screen, in portrait mode on both the normal iPad and the jumbo iPad, it's compact width, regular height. Then if you rotate it, it's by, by default, you have regular width and one compact. So you have like an iPad view and a single like iPhone view. And then on the smaller iPads, if you, if you move the, the slider to the middle, have completely evenly spacing. On smaller iPads, it's compact, compact. But on the regular, on the jumbo iPads, it's actually regular, regular. So it's, fu it's two full screen iPad apps rendered next to each other. Um, so I just had this little debate before this, this talk started, but um, I like, I'm a simple person. I like to think of it like this, but some people <laughs> apparently disagree. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. And obviously, there's very discrete cases where one, like this is not a mold that will fit everything. So it's still up to the, the possibly to the developer to, to, to listen to the size class and then ignore it. But um, usually, because the, the terms compact and regular are so arbitrary, I like, you know, and... Like, at least portrait and, and, and landscape made more sense, but in this case, like, I, I have like a memory map to iPhone and iPad just to keep it in, in straight in my head what these two terms actually mean. Um, so the next thing is, where do they live? Like, it's kind of hard to find out to access the size class unless you know where to look. Um, so they're actually exposed on this class called UI Trait Collection. And the UI Trait Collection is this object that explains not just the size classes, but a lot of things about the current environment of the, of the device. Things like pixel density, um, on, certain, on certain regions like in like, um, like the Middle East, where language is rendered from left to right in iOS 10, it actually mentions that here. On tvOS 10, this is where um, you can access whether the user has set light mode or dark mode, and you can respond to if they change the light mode, the, the, the theme on the fly. Um, it, also, it also provides information whether you're using a 6S or a 6S Plus that has 3D touch. It also exposes that through there. But for the most part, the main reason why I access it is to check the horizontal size class and the vertical size class. So where does this thing live? Well, basically, it lives, on, um, it lives in a protocol called UI Trait Environment, so it's, which is kind of hard, because it's not explicitly attached to um, other classes. So you have to figure out which classes extend to that uh, protocol. And the good thing is both UIView and both UIView controller uh, um, uh, uh, support it. So if you're overriding either a UIView or a UIView controller, you can just do self.trait collection, and you'll get that information straight away. OK. Implementing the functionality. So, 
how do we actually get split screen working in our app? Well, the good news, or possibly the bad news, is it's on by default. All we have to do is compile against the iOS 9 SDK, provide a launch screen storyboard, enable all possible device orientations. Like if you do an iPhone app, upside down is usually off, so you have to explicitly turn that on. And that's pretty much it. But if you are like me and you've got an app that is totally not ready for split screen yet, you can also do the opposite thing and explicitly disable it by adding an extra flag to your P list saying requires full screen. Um, so as you can see, the, a lot of things can happen. Um, like if the user is changing, the, like changing the, the width of the split screen or if they are moving between like light mode and dark mode. Um, there was another method in that UI trait environment protocol, trait collection did change. So you can actually override this in your subclasses and then use this to actually work out if you need to do any work to respond to a trait collection. Now this will always trigger <coughs> for a variety of, um, variety of things. Like maybe you don't really care that like, like on the tvOS light mode and dark mode happened. So it's always necessary to actually go through and compare with the previous trait collection objects that's provided that what you care about is the thing that actually changed. So you only, you only respond to that when it's actually necessary to do the work. And we had this discussion earlier. Um, like, it doesn't get cooled as often as you think you might. For example, if you rotate a small iPad to, to landscape and portrait and back again, nothing actually changes. Like, the, the, the trait collections in the size classes stay the same, so nothing actually gets triggered. So it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of like playing with it to see if it's actually responding when you're expecting it to. And if not, you can, you can actually just respond to a size change instead, and, and that, that's a lot more reliable. Um, so this is, this is the size, size changes. Uh, this is the API that replaced the will rotate to interface orientation of the older UI view controller um, class. This is, this is a lot nicer, I think, in my opinion, because you, it's a single, single method. And the nice thing is you actually get an explicit animation block provided as a, as a coordinator object which means you can actually provide non-animated layout or animated layout if you want. So you actually a lot more fine-grained control. It's a lot more clean. So actually, I'm actually really happy this happened. And that happens for both like, device rotations and when you're playing with split screen. So you know that when that happens, you need to do some sort of layout code. Um, and finally, this, was, this has been around since iOS 5, but there's also view layout subviews and view did layout subviews, which you can use to, to, to just basically set up and, and also do any changes if, if sizes change without an animation. Um, storyboards are great. Well, relatively speaking, I, I don't like storyboards very much because I had this, this horrific time once where I, I tried to merge one with 50 view controllers into source control and it exploded. Um, so, but that's, that was a long time ago and it's a lot better now. Now that we have like storyboard references and the ability to have um, a lot more granular storyboards. Um, <coughs> so um, the good thing about storyboards is they, they really remove a lot of the work. So, or at, le or at least if you use nibs instead of storyboards. Um, they remove a lot of the work because you can, you can basically set up your constraints. And in Xcode 8, you get some even more cool stuff. You can set up constraints, and then you can set up, if you can see um, up in the menu there, you can actually set separate properties for separate trait collections. So you can automatically say, OK, in iPad mode, in, in regular, it's this big. But on, the, on, on compact, it's this big. Um, it's really nice. It's, and that, that's coming in Xcode 8 very soon, like when it ships probably next week. Um, and it's a, it's a lot cleaner than what we currently have, where we have this arbitrary square UI that doesn't really match up with what we see on our devices. Um, so I definitely recommend, if you can, try and do as much as you can in, in Interface Builder, because you're saving yourself a ton of code. Um, UI Split View Controller <coughs> used to be iPad exclusive up until iOS 8. Now it's, it's really cool, in fact, that if you render it in compact, it behaves like a UI navigation controller. And if you transition to regular, it becomes the, the split view controller that you're aware of. So this is great because you get all this amazing dynamic changing transition functionality for free with just one view controller. It's free. Um, UI popover presentation controller. So back before this all happened, uh, you, you used to have to present view controllers on the iPad using a UI popover view controller. And that did not make sense in this unified um, sort of sense where you could be going between a full screen co uh, compact view or, or a large screen um, popover. So what happened now is view controllers have a property where you can set the modal presentation style to popover, and then you, 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 conf you configure it via this popover presentation controller object on the view controller, and then present it like a normal modal controller. And you get the same functionality. And then if the user is also moving between split screen and not, you, you move between full screen and, and popover straight away. But the takeaway from this is even though if you're on an iPhone, you still have to set the source view where a popover would appear because just in case it does move to that while you're in iPhone mode, it will have to then realign where you said it should appear. Same goes for UI alert view and UI alert UI action sheet. Um, they got deprecated in favor of this generic UI alert controller kind of class. It does the exact same thing as UI pop overview, uh, as the, um, before the UI presentation controller. 
um, in the fact that you set up your, you set up your credentials, you create, you create a UI alert controller instance, you add buttons as UI alert action objects, which is even nicer than before, because now you can actually add your actions as closures or blocks. And then you present, it, you present it using the proper representation control API before. So you set a source rect, and then you present it as a modal controller, and then the system does the rest. And then finally, um, one other cool little thing is you, I'm trying to figure out how much time I have left. Five minutes, okay, cool. Um, you, uh, you can also set UI images for separate traits. So for example, if you have like a, a button with an icon on an iPhone, but then on the iPad it's a bigger button and demands a bigger icon, you can actually have separately sized, um, separately sized icons that will then appear depending on the size, on, on the size class. Well, you could just use paint code and, and, be, and be done with this, but if you don't use paint code, I recommend you to use paint code, um, this is a system you can use. Um, this is really cool because it, it, you, you basically just pull in all the assets you want, you dictate on per trait which image uh, is attached to what, and then this is automatically like, provided through a UI image. And basically what this means is when you attach it to a UI image view, it is smart enough to go, okay, this UI image view currently has these traits, which means I need this image. So it'll pull, it from, it'll pull that image from UI image, um, the UI image catalog. And then if you do a trait transition, it'll then replace that with the appropriate image on the fly. So you get a lot of free functionality um, straight out of like, just straight out of image asset catalogs, which is great. Okay, last section. So I have, I have a, an app I've been working on for a long time. It's a comic book reader, and it does not support uh, split screen just yet because it uh, basically, because of this reason, I've used, I've used the hell out of UI user interface idiom. So the entire UI is like two completely separate tracks of code. So it is really not appropriate, like easy for me to, to pull it out. So if you are thinking about migrating, migrating a, an old app to, to this new system, basically the first thing you have to do is you have to pull the, all this, these, this kind of code out. Um, because it's just not appropriate anymore. Because you'll 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 get you'll get an iPad idiom if you try and call it on an iPad, even if you're in the compact view. So um, when I was refactoring my my open source view controllers, basically I had to take a step back and say, well, why was I calling it is iPad? Is it just because the trait collection was regular or compact? And most of the time it was. So most of the time I only really cared about the horizontal size class. It wasn't ever necessary to check about the vertical size class. Um, so for smaller view controllers, it was really, it's really just a matter of just saying, if, if layout is compact, then I can just do the same thing as before. But just at the same time, you have to make sure that this, co this code is also called again when, it, when a transition actually happens. Another crazy thing that is necessary now is um, if you have an app that generates like cached data, like for example, thumbnails, like iBooks is a good example of this, because you download a, a, like a book, you grab the title, and you have to generate a thumbnail, but the thing is, iPad has a certain size of thumbnail, but then the iPhone has a separate size of thumbnail. So now it becomes necessary to consider, okay, so if I'm making a, an app that's adaptable and actually has split screen, I'm gonna have to actually, either on the fly or maybe in advance, actually generate two sets of thumbnails, and then, as necessary, um, I'm gonna have to transition my, my um, thumbnail, my view controller, my collection view controller, to use these different sizes, depending on what current uh, size class it's adopting. Um, funny side note, a, a while ago, I actually jailbroke my iPad and introspected iBooks, and for some crazy reason, they store all the thumbnails inside core data, which is, um, I was told it was a bad idea, but apparently Apple does it, so there you go. Um, kind, of what, kind of like implied before, if Apple has made a controller or, or some kind of like feature that you can use, I recommend using that instead of trying to reinvent the wheel yourself. I have a lot of custom view controllers in my code, and they're basically useless now. I have to refactor all of them to use this new, this new size class model, and Basically what that means is, like, the, the, the crux of the matter is, if Apple changes things, if you have, as, the more custom code you have, the more you have to respond to this. So if it's just a matter of compromising on your vision and being able to use an Apple-sanctioned an Apple, like, first-party controller or UI con component as opposed to your own one, it's always good to consider that instead of having a, a really amazing, shiny, sparkly um, like, custom view that you have to keep rewriting every time Apple does a new iteration of iOS. There are, there are some third-party apps that actually um, that do this, the biggest one's Tweetbot. Tweetbot has, got, has customized the hell out of it. Like even the, the, the alert boxes and the action sheets, they're all custom. So you can do this if you want. Um, and obviously Tweetbot is a, is a shiny example of a really good app on iOS. So um, you can do it if you want, like I'm not discouraging it, but at the same time, I just want to make, make sure everyone wears it, is aware that it's a compromise on quality versus time versus, yeah, versus future proof. Again, Interface Builder is your friend. Just, yeah, do as much as you can in there. Like, you don't have to worry about auto layout code, because that stuff is a nightmare without third-party libraries. Um, 
it's really easy now to just set, set properties for certain traits. So it's like most, most of this stuff is tons of code condensed into one little relatively hard to merge XML file. Um, so I kind of recommend, I really recommend that if you can do an interface builder, even if it's just nibs, like that will save a lot of time and code and effort. And I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on this threshold, so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd mention it. I'm considering just like, just like throwing out all my code. It's objective C, it's old, it's going to die soon. Um, if you abuse the hell out of UI, use the interface idiom, might be necessary. Um, it's a good opportunity if your code base is still Objective C. Like Swift is the future, Objective C is going to go away. I, I'm still kind of stuck to Objective C because I really want Swift ABI compatibility to happen before I do, do the final push to, to Swift. But um, maybe next year. Um, but at the same time, it's just like it's just a great opportunity to to simplify a code um, because basically um, the goal, Apple's overarching goal here is one code path that can adapt to any size. So so you shouldn't have any need for separate code paths in your in your code. The idea is just one discrete one that, that you can, is automatic as much as possible. And yeah, build something awesome, make it great, and come present it at DevWorld next time. Thanks, thanks for my thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>